see it? It's a 20-year-old kid. I didn't see the age. Good morning, years. Rock Church. Good morning. Um, while people are kind of getting settled in, I want to address, before we get started, I want to address the events of yesterday. Um, I, uh, I won't belabor this, uh, but one of, the, one of the things that I, if anything good comes out of an attempt on someone's life, one of the things I was sharing with the praise team today when we were practicing was that Jesus Christ has received more glory through what happened. Um, the test, the, the newscasters, the people who are saying the only way that Trump is still alive is through the grace of God. They use the grace of God. They um, they used all kinds of language that pointed towards God, and I believe that. Now here we sit, and I'm going to say to you what I said to the praise team. I'm going to ask you a question. If your recognition of the providence of God through what happened yesterday was elevated, what if the shoe would have been on the other foot? What if that was President Biden? And my hope is that you would be able to sit here today and say, and it would still be the same. Because something... Yes, I'm political. Yeah, I mean, I'd be a liar to say I'm not. But I'm not so political that I don't recognize what the Scripture says when it says that all governments are from God. All of them. And those that are in power are in power with the permission of God. He allows that. And then He looks at us and I, forget about looking at us, what Paul was writing to, and this is later on in Romans, he's going to tell them to pray for their leaders, for their political leaders. Pray for them. Do you know that he was telling them to pray for the people who were killing their brothers and sisters in Christ? And so when, when Paul brings it up to pray for your leaders, he's not bringing it up in a context of in a context of do you agree with him or do you not agree with him he's bringing it up in this context and I can't say I understand this completely but I, I'm going to tell you what it says that President Biden is not the president unless God allows him to be president that's what Romans would say Caesar Nero would not have been Caesar unless God allowed a Christian killing, Christian um, blaming person to be there. He would not have been Caesar. So ours is, and I know what I know what you think because you think like I think in this, and you think, well, I want to figure it out. I mean, there's something here. There's something here. There's, you go ahead and spend your time doing that, but don't. Do it at the failure to pray for your leaders. It's everything. And so I don't know what happens in November. I don't know what happens before November. But I know whatever happens, God already knows and he's already allowing it. Don't forget that. That's not the wisdom of Rick Clark. That's the wisdom of God. That's his word. And so what I'd like us to do before we get started, before we worship our real leader, our real King Jesus, before we do that, I'd like for us to spend a few moments praying, okay? Would you bow your heads with me? Lord Jesus, there is nothing that happens that gets beyond your notice. And I praise you for that because from our perspective, when everything seems to go inside out and upside down, we just think uh, all hell is breaking loose and there's nothing that can be done to control it. But Lord, we know that you are the one. You are the God. 
You are our king. You are our leader. You are the king of any of the kings on the earth. You permit people to serve in power who are evil, and yet you permit people to serve in power who are good. And so, God, because we don't fully understand all of your moving this morning, I'm just saying we surrender to you. We surrender to your will. And I pray that you would put in us this very strong desire to let those that are in our world, those in our circle of influence, let them know that what really matters is Jesus, our King. We trust you. We submit to you. And we ask you as you move and as you work through all of these things that you will have your way and that we will see your handprints all over this. I thank you that Trump was not killed yesterday. And I pray that as he continues to do his work, that you continue to work through him. And I pray, Lord, for President Biden. And I ask, Father, that you keep him safe and that you, uh, you thwart those things that would just create so much confusion and so much difficulty. We love you. We submit to you as the King of Kings. And now as we begin to worship, Lord, may we set aside all the worry, all the concern, all the talk, all the trying to figure things out. And may we just focus our full attention on you. It's in your great name we pray. Amen. 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 So if you would, Rock Church, I'm going to ask you now, let's get at this and let's stand and let's sing to our king. All right? Just give me a minute to get my guitar on.
Oh 
digging into the book of Romans, which we haven't dug far, but we've gotten some places. <laughs> last week, I don't want you to miss this, where Paul says in the last two verses, 16 and 17 of chapter 1, he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of it. Because it's the power of God unto salvation. Yes. First to the Jew and then to the Gentile. And then he ends that little section with this. And the just shall live by faith. Yep. You know, that is the great history-making, life-changing news of the gospel. That's it. And we do not have to be ashamed. We, know, we don't have to stand ashamed. But we can stand boldly on the truth that God loves his people. I want you to hang on to that because I'm going to talk about it just a little bit today. God loves his people so much that he would give himself. He would take on the wrath of God for us. Amazing. And that's why this next song that Lindley's going to sing, it's called Reckless Love. Yep. And someone said, God's love's not reckless. I don't mean, no, no, it's not like it, it wasn't planned or anything. I'm just saying God went as far as he could go to even give himself for our sins. That kind of love. He abandoned everything for you and for me. What a wonderful, wonderful gift. <laughs>
want to thank you so much this morning for your reckless love. That you would just abandon everything to come after us. To come and give your life for us. This morning we stand before you and say thank you. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for giving yourself for our sin. As undeserving as we are. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, as we take communion this morning, I pray that you would speak to our hearts. And we take it together remembering the great price paid for our sin. In your mighty name I pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. it and broke it apart and gave it to his disciples and said take and eat for this is my body and he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying this is the blood of the new covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sin each one drink from it to worry about. There's enough trouble. We need to get focused on Him. Um, before we take a little break so that the parents can take their kids back to Kids Rock and so that you all can greet one another, um, 
I want to just kind of keep you posted on Ken Race. Last week he he came up uh, to the to the altar here at the middle of the service right after communion and we anointed him and prayed for him for the pancreatic cancer that he's dealing with. Uh, he was having a big surgery on Tuesday. That's right, big surgery on Tuesday. But anyway, they went in and when they went in, they found out that he had spots on his liver and things they weren't expecting to to find and so they rather than open them up and make things more difficult they just came out and they didn't go through with the surgery uh, the prognosis with pancreatic cancer is typically never good and uh, but I want to say this to you and Ken if you're listening um, I, I, I want you to understand this just like I said at the beginning God already knows what's going to happen he, he already knows. He says in the scripture that he's got your days numbered. Your life is numbered just like mine is. And Jesus would go on to say, what can a man do to add a single day to his life? Because God is so in control and he is so intimately uh, in touch with you and your life that he knows it all before you even ask or before you bring it to his attention. And so when God says... It's your time to come on home. Then it's time to go home. And I don't know when that's going to be with Ken. He's he's weak, but he's able to talk. He's able to communicate. Um, but what I do know is that God's got him right now this morning in his hands. And whenever he draws his last breath, whenever Rick Clark draws his last breath, he's going to be in the presence of Jesus. Amen. He's going to be in so much better shape than you. So I rejoice in that part, but the grief and the hurt through the struggle is what we have to deal with. And I deal with it knowing that God has Ken in his hands absolutely believe that. Stake my life on it. Not because Ken's a great guy, which he is, but God is a perfect God. And his son is a perfect Savior. Okay. Well, I'm still going to talk more about that today. So I want you to just take your little break here. Get rid of your kids. And... Uh, <laughs> And then come on back and we're going to dig in the Word together, all right? All right. You know, this is kind of a cool seat when you send everybody out to take a break. I never knew what people did at the break over in the cinema. You couldn't see outside the four walls of the room. Well, here I can because there's windows out there. And it's funny to watch people walk out there and go, man, there's leftover donuts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is a great place. Yeah. Um, okay, we are, we are in the book of Romans. Uh, we, for those of you who might be here for the first time, we're actually just starting our way through the book. Last week we got uh, through verse 17 of chapter 1 which all focused on the gospel. Now what I'm, what I'm hoping, there's so, there's so many gold nuggets in the book that every week we get together, it's just like, man, I, that's something. But we can't get there until we deal with probably something that people use as an excuse to not go to church. Well, when you go to church, the preacher, all he preaches about is hell, fire, and damnation. And so, now, you, and I get asked that. You're not one of those kinds of preachers, are you? And I said, well, it depends. Uh, I, I, I can be, uh, but no, I, I understand what you're saying. And, and I'm not, I'm typically not that person. Today, I am that person. I am that person because I could just blow through this in the book of Romans and, and not really deal with it, skip over it because there's some such interesting stuff right after it. 
But I thought this week as I, I sat down at the desk and I, I was just starting to go through what I wanted to talk about, I wanted to get away from it, but I couldn't get away from it. And so I told Cindy, I said, I'm, I'm going to just go out and take a walk. And so it was that, it kind of felt like you were in hell. It was so hot outside. <laughs> and, and so I, I was walking, and, and the, as I walked, it, it was just like, I couldn't get this off of my heart that we need to land here for a little bit. And so before we really move forward, the more I thought about it, the more I understand that if you don't warn people of the penalty of their sin, if you don't warn people that unless they confess Christ as their Savior, there's a real judgment coming. And, and Paul hints on it just a little bit, but I want to, I just want to walk through it. It's last week we started out with, with the good news and we started out in Romans 1 verses 16 and 17. This, this is where we ended, which as I said when we were on the stage singing just a little bit, here's what it says. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes First to, to the Jew, uh, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith. From first to last, just as, as it is written, the righteous or the just will live by faith. And that verse is, is as I said last week, is kind of the central verse to the entire book of Romans. And we're going to... Romans is really going to identify for us what our lives should look like, how we live. That's the part of this text that, that Romans focuses on. Now that I've come to faith in Christ, what does my life look like? What does all of my life look like? What does it look like when no one else is around? What does it look like when my family's around? What does it look like when my buddies are around or what does it look like so this is this is the focus of Romans but the good news Paul just laid it out there remember what the gospel means it means the life changing uh, history making love of God and so when when we encounter that and Paul brings us right to it at the very beginning it's a wonderful thing to encounter and you walk away from those 17 verses and go, yes, that makes sense. I can't justify myself. I cannot justify the sin in me. Only God could do that by granting me his mercy and his grace. Something I could not do for myself. And so we come to that place. Well, it makes us feel good about digging into Romans until we get to the first four words of verse 18. Look at this. It's going to be on the screen as well. Look at the first four words of your text. If you have your Bible with you, and, and I invite you to bring it or get your phone out so that you can grab onto some of these nuggets. But look at the first four words. The wrath of God. Now we've just spent... Oh, last week talking about the love of God. And now here we are talking about the wrath of God. I mean, Paul just went from the mountaintop to the valley. He... <laughs> See, it just makes me dance. Don't know what it is. Um, so so God, God, we're being told, has a side to him that is wrath. And, and one of the troubles we have is how do we even justify that? How can we say this God, who is a God of love and mercy and grace, is also a God of wrath and judgment? How do, where do we go with that? So I want to read the text in its full, and then we'll, we'll dig in a little bit. Um, we'll look at verses 18 to 23. Here we go. 
The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the ungodliness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Uh, do me, if, if you're taking notes or you're writing in your Bible, circle the word there. I want you to circle the word there, them, they, themselves, as many times as it shows up, because it shows up a bunch, because next week we're going to be talking about who are they? Who are the them? You know when someone says, how did you know that? Well, they told me. Well, who's they? You know, who's your source? Well, that's what we want to know, because he's going to say they, them, themselves. He's going to use it 16 times through this little section. So we want to know, okay, who are they? And, and we will. We'll find that out, but not this week. Um, so verse 19, since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. Now this is huge. Just stop right there. Let, let me just say this. When you ask me the question, well, what about that little boy that's raised in that Eastern religion country who has never encountered God, never encountered Jesus, no one's ever come and told him, and when he dies, he, he's never heard of Jesus. What happens to him? Well, my immediate answer is, I don't know. That's my immediate answer, which is the truth. But God is saying here that people have no excuse for not recognizing God simply by seeing what he has made. He put it out there. Now we've been raised, and everyone in uh, my generation and going forward, we have been raised in a time where you cannot talk about God, you cannot bring him up in the public school systems, you, they don't bring him up in the university <laughs> settings. God is eliminated to the point that when you look, your presupposition is, well, I don't know who did this, but certainly it can't be God because he's not a part of the equation. But God says it is so plain and evident if you look at the things he's made that you will be without excuse for rebelling against him. That's a strong statement. And so that's what I would say. I would use a verse like this to someone say, when someone says, what about that little Buddhist boy? Because that little Buddhist boy has been talked about for a long time. Um, all you can say is that if he never hears of God, he can see the handiwork of God. And if you argue with me any farther, that's when I say to you, well, if this little Buddhist boy bugs you so much, <laughs> buy a plane ticket. Amen. Go talk to him. Go on. So don't complain and blame God who has already proved himself to us. Don't go doing that. If it's really concerning to you, well, what about my neighbor? Go talk to your neighbor. Go get them. Is your mission field? I gotta keep my mouth shut. <laughs> no, no, no. Talk to them. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Can I say that there are a lot of futile, foolish, dark hearts today? Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. And they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. Now that's the text, and that's where I'm going to stop as far as our study today. I don't want you to miss what I'm about to say to you. No, and this is going to be on the screen. God is a God of love and mercy to those who love Him and worship Him. 
Do you understand that? He is a God of love and mercy to those who love Him and worship Him. This is a big deal. The second thing I want you to get is this. Go ahead and put the next one. God, this God of love and mercy, is a God of wrath and judgment to those who deliberately turn from Him and worship themselves and their desires. Now, as big as big as this is, this is really kind of interesting. Um, I'm looking for him right now. Where's Josh? Josh Nichols. <laughs> I'm looking for you, dude. I'll, I'll find you. It was really neat. Uh, right uh, as he as he came in this morning, he walked up. Rick, I've got a question for you. So when we go to heaven, and the Bible says that we're going to be judged. How are we going to be judged? What are we going to be judged on? This was a discussion you were having, right? With some other people this past week. And I love it when people have those kinds of discussions. And I enjoy just kind of jumping in on them when I get asked to. Um, how are you going to be judged? You, the follower of Jesus. You are going to be judged when you die, when you draw your last breath, and now you are in the presence of God. You are standing before the throne because that's the text you guys were talking about. I saw everybody standing before the throne and they were judged. How are you going to be judged? For those who believe in Jesus Christ, and I don't mean, oh yeah, I believe the guy existed. I believe he died, and I love Easter because of all the candy, and I believe he rose too. Um, I'm not talking about head knowledge. Although you need to have head knowledge. I'm certainly not downplaying that. I'm talking about knowledge in your gut. Knowledge in your inner being. That he, I believe it so much that it affects how I live my life. Amen. He changes me. And so for that person, when you draw your last breath, you are going to be judged by what you have lived believing. By the death of Jesus Christ on the cross for your sin. So when God looks at you, because you have made that decision to follow him, he sees you through the blood of Jesus Christ, which cleanses you from all unrighteousness. So when he judges you, he looks at you, he looks at Josh and he says, Josh, your judgment, yeah, it had to be paid for. It had to happen because God's a God of justice. And your judgment now, I put on my son. And he died to pay for that. And because you put your faith in that, and because you surrendered your life to him, then come on in. Well done, good and faithful servant. Amen. Enter on into the things I have prepared for you. But for the one, don't miss this. The one who rejects God, the one who rejects Jesus. I, remember, I can believe in Jesus and still reject him. That's exactly what Bart Ehrman's done. He's a professor of the New Testament. And he's an atheist. He believes Jesus, there was a Jesus. He believes it. He believes he died on a cross. He has no problem with that. But he has no confidence that his death on the cross was for his sins. And he has zero confidence that there was a resurrection. So, so for you who have, you know about Jesus, but you've held back all your life. You've got more important things to do. Little do you know, this is the most important thing. Amen. And so, so now, when you die... When the unbeliever dies, the unbeliever stands before the judgment 
And when the unbeliever is judged, it is not going to be through the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because you've already rejected that. So there's only one other way to judge you. And that's through your life. And don't go sitting there and say, well, that's not bad. I'm, I'm not a really bad person. Can I, let me just toss this out. I'm getting so far ahead of myself right now. It's okay. Listen to me. I don't care how many Sundays in a row you make it to the Rock Church. If you don't know Jesus, you're going to hell. Yep. I, I don't care how good you think you are, how many good works, how much money you've given to charity. If you don't know Jesus, you're going to hell. This Because you are going to be judged then without Christ. You're going to be judged on your life. There was a guy... Back when I was doing student ministry years ago, I remember hearing this account and, and it really got my attention. And I love how the speaker at this uh, young adult and student convention, I love how he responded to the question of a girl who came up to him at the end of his time talking and said to him this. I am going to go to heaven when I die. Not because I trust Jesus to save me, but really, I, I can't, honestly, I, I'm a good person. I, I can't really think of, of things I've done wrong. So I, I really, I, I get what you're saying, but I don't need that. And with the wisdom of God, I believe, honestly, the speaker said this, looked a young lady in the eyes and said, well, let me ask you a question. How many sins do you figure you commit a day? She said, oh, probably three. <laughs> probably three. Okay. He said, so three, let's say three times 365. Let's just, let's just get a round number, say a thousand. So in a year's time, you're going to sin a thousand times. Okay. And what are you, 20? Yeah, I'm 20. He said, well, let's just say you live to be 60. And you have 40 years of living your good life. And then you die. And then he asks her a question. Do you mean to tell me? that you really believe that you are going to stand before God with 40,000 sins on your back and say, I'm a good person and I deserve to come. How can you even entertain that thought knowing that God cut Adam and Eve off because of how many sins? One. One. It's a great response. He never did say how the girl responded. If I was that girl, I think I'd have been on my knees. <laughs> okay, I want it, I want it. But we, we live in this time where we want everybody to get along. We want everybody to be okay. And the truth of the matter is, no one is okay without Jesus Christ. And the only reason Christians are okay is not because of them. It's because of the one in them, because of Jesus Christ. Uh, a, a quick little history about this wrath. In the, in the Old Testament, the Jews of the Old Testament believed that there was this present age, this current time, today, which is evil, and then there was the golden age to come, which was God restoring everything back to the way it was at creation. And separating the present age and the age to come, the golden age, was the great day of wrath and judgment of God. Now, in the Old Testament, you will read a number of prophets who use that very phrase. And on that day, that great day of wrath and judgment of God, they believed there was a day that was going to divide those two times 
and that day then would would be when God just unloads his wrath on everyone today in in, in the church today and here's here's speaking your language one speaking your language speaking uh, <laughs> church language today I would say there's this present age the rapture's coming God's taking his church out and then God's pouring out his wrath on everybody and then he's going to restore everything back to how it was originally intended to be where there is no more sorrow no more sin no more suffering because all those things are past everything's been made new that's how we understand it Jesus is going to actually talk about it and when Jesus talks about it it's in Matthew 24 um, by the way just so I can tell you this in Matthew 24 the very first time I ever read this chapter scared me to death made me nervous and I swore I'd never read it again Matthew 24 I'll pick it up at verse 42 and I'll read uh, to the end of the chapter therefore keep watch because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. So for those of you who believe, and I hope you all believe, that there is a day coming when Jesus is coming back. He's going to return. It's the only thing in Scripture that has not been fulfilled in Scripture regarding Jesus. He is coming back. So how do I live now knowing that he's coming back and knowing that I don't have a clue when he's coming back? Okay, that's what this is all about. Uh, keep watch because you don't know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this. If the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch, which means he'd had his gun loaded, and w would not have let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready because the Son of Man is going to come at an hour when you do not expect him. So who then is the faithful and wise servant whom the master has put in charge of the servants in his household to give them their food at the proper time? It will be good for that servant whose master finds him doing so when he returns. Truly I tell you that he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But suppose that servant is wicked and says to himself, well, my master is staying away a long time. And he then begins to beat his fellow servants and eat and drink with the drunkards. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him at an, and at an hour when he is not aware of, he will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus is, a, is the Son of God filled with love and grace, and he just told you that it's going to be tough on some people. Yep. And it's going to be tough on those who had rejected, who planned on doing it all themselves. He, it's going to be tough. This is, this is difficult language, to be sure. Um, okay. So how do we mesh God's love with God's wrath. I've got four ways that we do that. How do we take the fact that he is love and that that uh, he is also a God of wrath and judgment? How do we put them together? Here's the first statement I want you to see. If God is a God of love, and he is, he must also be, please understand this, a God of justice. Yep. To be a God of love, there has to be justice. There isn't a parent in here who doesn't understand that statement. You love your children. You wonder why your children got all your spouse's bad traits. <laughs> I'm trying to say that gently. You, out of love for them, because you love them, purposefully step into their life and discipline them, punish them, Create pain for them so that, and I'm going to go ahead and say this, and not, not beat them, not abuse them, 
You can't go home and say, well, Rick said. No, you can't do that. But you do this out of love for your children. It's justice. If you do this, then this is what happens. And then when they do this, you start counting to ten. <laughs> yeah. Just go on and do what you said you were going to do. Okay? You'll get it taken care of quicker. Anyway. Okay. If God's a God of love, and He is, He must also be a God of justice. Second statement. The love of God and the justice of God come together at the cross. They meet at the cross because on that cross, J Jesus is taking on the judgment, the punishment of your sin. So they meet together at the cross. Do you remember when Jesus said while on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why did God forsake him? Because God had put on him all the judgment that belongs on all the world. Mm -hmm. That's where justice and love came together. Next statement. Jesus on the cross <laughs> is making full and complete payment for the sin of the entire world. I put the entire world there for a reason. This, is, this isn't nothing to you. You understand it. But it is in theological circles. Some people believe Jesus only died for a few or he died for everybody. I'm just, he died for everybody. Wouldn't disappoint me at all to know that. It would make sense, actually, because that's the depth of his love. Okay, but on the cross, he's making that full and complete payment for sin. Now, keep on going. And out of God's love, this is where it all comes together. He gives you the what? Freedom. Now, he gives you Freedom to do what? Receive, receive, or, receive reject. or reject Jesus to what? Die to yourself. To die to yourself and to what? Come alive in Him. Come alive in Him. And Paul's going to spend a lot of time in Romans on this very thing. He is giving you, He's giving me the opportunity to get it. To open my eyes and finally see it. It took me a long time to open my eyes and finally see it. And it took a lot of you a long time to open your eyes and finally see it. But when God opens your eyes to let you know that I love you so much that I am going to take all your sin and I'm going to take all the punishment that you deserve, the hell that you deserve, the death that you deserve. Death meaning eternal separation from God. You deserve it. We've all earned it. All of us. But I'm going to take it and I'm going to put it on my son. I love you that much. It's no wonder that Paul would eventually come to the place where he said, how can you reject such a great salvation? How do you hear that? And it not just disturb your soul. The only way it doesn't disturb you is you're so caught up in seeing life through your own eyes that you've totally been blinded to the love of God. Okay. Now, when people, oh, I, I want to, I'm glad I have a couple notes up here. On the day Jesus died, it's kind of interesting to me. I hadn't really thought about this. There were scads of people around. All the way up the Via Della Rosa, as he was dragging his cross out of Jerusalem, out of the city, and up to the hill, Mount Calvary, which we know as Golgotha, the place of the skull where criminals were executed on the cross. Jesus is dragging his own cross among throngs of people who, because uh, Jerusalem was packed with people. It was the day of atonement. It was their big day. It's the day when all their sins were paid for by the priest, get, 
killing a lamb. And so people, as Jesus is walking with that cross, people are mocking him, spitting on him, hitting him. It wasn't like the guards were trying to spare this guy any pain. They'd already inflicted all the pain they could muster up. So everybody was busy with Jesus. And they get him up to Golgotha and, and they drive the nails in his hands and they drive the nails in his feet and they stand him up. And then after they stand him up on the cross, they stand the cross up and there he hangs. After they stand the cross up, then people would walk by. And they would mock him. They would laugh at him. They would still spit at him. Spit at the foot of the cross. Because who are you to think that you are God? Who are you to think that you're the Son of God? Who are you to think that you're the Messiah? He was totally, completely, absolutely rejected. And on that day, with all of those people, don't you know that there were two people whose lives were drastically changed that day? Two people. One was a guy who knew he deserved to be dying. He was a thief. Yeah. And he was hanging on one of the crosses there next to Jesus. Jesus hung actually between two thieves. And one of them started from him. This is crazy to me. But one of them is dying on the cross and mocking Jesus. So you think you're the son of God, huh? It sounds so stupid, doesn't it? I'm dying, I'm getting ready to die, and I'm just, I'm just digging in and questioning everything that Jesus had said about himself. And yet on the other side was another thief who was just as guilty as the other thief. And he looks at Jesus, and at some point in their time there on the cross before they all died, this thief looks to Jesus and says, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus musters enough strength up to look back over at that one and respond. He had no response to the one mocking him. And he says to the one, today, I'm telling you the truth. Today, you're going to be with me in paradise. That's a changed life. Yep. Right there on the cross. Someone says, do you believe in deathbed confessions? I'm like, are you kidding? Yeah. <laughs> the Bible's got it right there. It's got it right there. Yeah. yeah. So, so we have that life change. Jesus then dies. Draws his last breath and dies. Darkness comes over the entire area. There's a storm that rages. There is an earthquake, a mighty my earthquake gets so strong that it affects the temple over in the city of Jerusalem and it causes the curtain to be torn into from top to bottom. And so so it was, it was a major earthquake. And having witnessed all the brutality and then the death and then all of nature screaming out, this is a horrible day. There's a Roman centurion who's been a part of this whole thing. And he says, truly, he must be the son of God. Two lives. That's it. Now, these three, these three slides I want you to see. This is just something I'd written down I want you to know. Let's go ahead with those. The decision to confess your sin, receive his forgiveness, and acknowledge Jesus Christ as your Savior is a decision to turn from your sinful ways, to die to yourself and your desires, to surrender the throne of your heart to God because right now you're the one sitting on it. And to begin living your life as a reflection of the one who lives in you. Too often, 
people get to hear about the love of Jesus Christ and say, I want that. I want that. I want it and I want my life to change and I want it to all be good and everything turn out just great. Well, when you cry out to Christ, you acknowledge him as the son of God. You acknowledge that you are not perfect, that you are a sinner and that you believe his death on the cross was sufficient punishment to pay for your sin. That you believe you rose from the dead that he rose from the dead, the scripture says you will be saved. And I want you to understand something. Please get this. Don't miss it. Following Jesus is not really easy. There's something about being able to live your life and sleep at night with a clean conscience. There's a lot to be said about that. But we live in a, in a time and in a place that's hostile towards Christianity. It always has been. The world has never been a friend of Christianity. And so you'll find yourself constantly in conflict. I wish someone would have told me that. I remember going, I went to an altar at the, finally at the Methodist church when it all clicked for me, when it finally clicked. I've been to the altar a few times. I just wanted everything to be fine, but it wasn't. It was all good until right after your parents took you out to eat to celebrate that you went to the altar, and then it all went south for me. But I learned that's how you get a free meal. Uh, so, and everybody seems to be happy, and you seem to be the center of attention. You know, that was all great. Well, when I finally got in line with all of that, and I understood that this requires a surrender. And when I finally surrendered everything to Christ, do you know I got up off my knees and I, oh, oh I listen, I was so pumped. I just couldn't wait for what was coming next. This is, this is the greatest, and I'm going to use the word feeling. This is the greatest feeling. I, I don't even know how to put this into words. I'm new. I'm different. I can't wait to see how good everything turns out. Do you know that within three months I had gotten so low of a grade that I was kicked out of college I was attending? This was Asbury. I'm glad they have grace though because they let me back in. <laughs> I was sent home, I went home, and all my people that I hung with and ran with, when I would tell them, I gotta tell you about the greatest thing that ever happened to me, and I tell them, we were no longer buddies. It was like, okay, you know, Rick, and I know, now listen, I know why you don't invite the preacher over for the parties. <laughs> I know. We might open a beer. <laughs> they all let me go because all the things we used to do together, I didn't do. And it was hard for me, though, in the, because the temptation was still so strong. But they didn't want someone around who wasn't going to join in. And I get it. I get it. it. There's this level of discomfort. I'm just saying, wouldn't it, be, wouldn't it have been nice if someone would have said, listen, one of the things you're risking is, are all your friendships. You're going to have people that you've been best buds with that you are no, they, they don't want to be around you. And all you did was get saved. But they don't want that because that influenced create some kind of guilt in their minds as if I'm God but yeah that's what happens I hate when I go work out at the Life Center which obviously has been a while um, when I go work out at the Life Center it was always good playing ball with some people who are here in the Rock Church now and before even they came to faith in Christ 
and eventually you get to know each other really well and eventually everybody starts asking hey so what do you work what do you do that kind of thing yeah. i i really never let it out that i was a pastor i just didn't for a long time why because i really enjoyed being with everybody and i knew the minute that came out everything changes so but what I did find out is that if you live your life for Christ, even in those places where you're not welcome, what I found out is everybody goes through struggles. Yes. And when they find someone they can be a friend with and confide in, not knowing whether they're a Christian or not, when they're really in it, they'll seek you out. And then when they seek you out, you have a wide open door to be able to share the gospel of Christ. Amen. That's how it was with Mike Kidd's dad. Mike, are you in here? We're out in the, huh? What are you doing over there? <laughs> that's, that's how it was with Mike Kidd's dad. It's how it was with uh, Dan Stevenson. It's how, it's how it was with, gosh, just, just a bunch of different folks. And it was through that then that they end up coming to faith in Christ. It's just, you have that same opportunity. I have that same opportunity. But this is the big deal. You have the choice. This is, this is the thing I really want you to know. Right here, right now, because I'm not speaking to the world, I'm speaking to you. I'm so glad you're here at the Rock Church. I'm so glad you're here. I thank God for that. But if you're here, and well, I know this because I was in a lot of churches before I became a Christian. I know you can be in a church and not be in a relationship with God. Yeah. You can like the uh, feeling of, yeah, it's good to be around some people. They're friendly. I know them, that kind of thing. So there's a fellowship aspect to it. There's an aspect of feeling like you did the kind of the religious duty that you feel like you should do. I, I've gone through all that. You've gone through that. But if that's you, I hope today, before we turn all the lights out in here and go home, that today, either right where you are or up here on your knees, you would actually come to the place where you quit playing games with God and you actually acknowledge him for who he is and his love for you. I promise you, you will never make a greater decision in your life than what you are going to do with Jesus Christ. No greater decision. And if, there was, if he was here this morning, I would right now say, aren't I right, Ken, Grace? No greater decision that he made with his life than to accept Christ. Amen. So that when he draws his last breath, he's going to be in his presence. But until he draws his last breath, Christ lives in him, even through the struggles. He's not alone. You don't have to be alone. And so this is what I want to do. Um, I'm going to play this really simple song. And what I want to do is invite you, certainly you can sing this as a prayer, but while we're singing it, I want you to consider just right where you're at, that you would bow your head, and that you would ask yourself, Search your own soul. Am I in a right relationship with God? Do I really believe that Jesus is his son? Do I really believe that he died for my sin? I mean, he took my punishment for crying out loud and died for my sin. Do I believe he rose from the dead? 
And am I ready to confess my sin, not to me, but to him? Confess the fact that you're a sinner and ask him to forgive you today, right here, right now, where you sit, where you kneel, however you want to do that. I invite you right now to bring yourself because you have to make the decision. God's done all he can do. Now it's on you. Is he calling you? Come on. Come on. I love you. Then respond to his love. You'll never, ever, ever regret it.
confessed you as their Lord and their Savior. And Lord, I pray that you would take such control of their lives that they will themselves notice the difference that it makes in following you rather than trying to lead our own way. Thank you for the forgiveness of sin. Thank you for the cleansing of the heart and the mind. And now by the power of your spirit, I pray that you will empower each individual here who is called out to you to go from here and live their lives in their homes, in their workplace, in their sphere of influence, and even when they're by themselves to live their lives for you. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. 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 No turning. Decide now to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. 